Professor Wen Chao Li from Boston University. Uh, Wen Chao had his uh, PhD degree from UC Berkeley in 2013 uh, with the ACM Outstanding System of Design and Design Automation. His recent, recent research interests include the uh, sure. measures, AI safety, machine learning, as well as the design automation. Uh, today he is going to talk about uh, AI safety from a full method of the so. Okay. OK, thank you for the, the kind introduction. So um, instead of making a, a blanket statement on the role of formal methods in the AI safety, as the agenda suggests, I'm going to focus on a specific uh, problem, um, which is uh, improving or even proving safety of neural network control systems. Uh, so again, I'm Wen Chao from uh, BU. Uh, this is joint work with my student, Jia Meng Fan, and also uh, my collaborators uh, at Northwestern uh, University and also University of Dayton. Um, so let me begin by uh, you know, telling you a little bit about uh, neural network controllers. Um, so really spurred by the exciting development in deep learning uh, in recent years, uh, there has been a growing interest in, in using neural networks in place of traditional controllers or even human uh, controllers. So this Nature paper uh, you know, talks about how to train an agent to achieve human level performance in a set of Atari games. Um, of course, this performance-driven view of the problems sometimes can actually end up with unintended consequences. So for example, if your uh, safety requirement is not properly encoded uh, in the reward function, um, then you can actually end up with an agent that does really well in terms of performance, but also crashes a lot, at least in simulation. Um, so another popular uh, learning paradigm is imitation learning. Um, so what that does is you're trying to transfer knowledge of an expert, of oftentimes a human expert, um, to, uh, to the learning agent. Um, and in this case here, uh, people have tried to do this uh, even end-to-end -end, uh, for robotic tasks or, or maybe even in a simulated autonomous driving uh, environment. So a, a common observation here is that uh, a lot of these successes are actually in simulated uh, environments. So the natural questions we ask is why have we haven't seen neural network controllers uh, in actions in real life. Um, interestingly, there's actually uh, some recent work in, uh, in implementing or in using neural network controllers, uh, and these are motivated by uh, practical uh, constraints, um, such as computation resources or maybe timing. Um, and the reason is because inference is typically quite fast for neural networks, and you actually want to use neural networks to approximate uh, an optimal uh, model predictive uh, controller, okay? So in this case, you actually have a good idea of what the model is. So let me just quickly go th through um, you know, what the setup is. So this is a very typical cyber-physical system. So you have a controller controlling some physical plant. Let's, for simplicity, assume that we have perfect sensors and actuators, which is never the case in real life. And in this case, uh, you know the physical model, which means that you know, like for example, the differential equations that governs the evolution of the physical process. Um, and um, just to, for notations, you know, x represent the state of the physical plant, and u represent the control uh, that the controller produces. So let's consider a sample data or time triggered controller, which means that. Uh, the controller operates at some period uh, delta. And if you look at the syst uh, system executions, um, uh, first of all, um, you know you would sense uh, a state of the physical plant, and then after delta, you would actually apply the controlled uh, output. Okay, so it looks like this, starting from some initial state at, at time zero, right? Uh, the controller would um, would drive the system to a new state. Okay, again, you applied a new input, a control input at time delta, right? And then you drive the, the system to another state, okay? So what are sort of neural network control systems? Simply, uh, now we are just replacing this controller typically uh, designed uh, using uh, traditional control laws by a neural network, okay? So what are the properties that we might want to care about in such a system? So let me uh, show you a similar uh, robotic manipulation task. Um, over here, um, we are trying to train a robotic arm to reach uh, some random, randomly generated goal states in the workspace uh, without hitting this uh, box obstacle in the middle, okay? 
So you can do this in various ways. You might want to train this using reinforcement learning. You might want to do it using imitation learning. Okay. Now the question is, does it actually work in real deployment? Right? So when we actually transfer the learn policy to an actual robot. So this is an experiment that sort of we did uh, in the lab. Um, so this is a Soya robot. And again, you're randomly generating ghost states. And then you have a small initial uh, set that the, the, the any factor can start in. And you want to know if you can always reach uh, the goal state without actually hitting or knocking over uh, the, the cup uh, on this box. Okay. So more formally, um, the reachability problem of neural network control systems looks like this. Your system starts in some initial set x0. There's some static avoid set on xa that you're, you're, you're given. And your goal is to to, to check um, if your controller or your neural network controller would actually drive the system to some target set, okay? So pictorially, you see that uh, the state of the system would involve, this is a trajectory of the system, um, and then you want to know whether it, um, you know, it would end up in the target set uh, after some finite, um, finite time, okay? So, um, more generally, so if you're just given a, a single initial set, you can just simulate, right? And then we'll figure this out. But suppose you now have an initial set of uh, states. And the rich avoid problem is to ask, if we start from any state in this initial set, uh, can the NNCS actually reach a state in the target set at some specific time uh, horizon? Uh, without hitting uh, the obstacle, right, or without reaching the avoid set. Okay, so this is the mathematical or the decision problem that we care about. Uh, it turns out that um, this problem is actually undecidable, um, and there's a very simple uh, reason for the uh, undecidability. Um, it's because NNCS are as uh, at least as expressive as uh, nonlinear continuous systems. So, for example, your dynamical plan could actually be a nonlinear continuous systems. So the exact reachability problem is not decidable. Okay. So what do we do? Um, one way to sort of circumvent uh, undecidability is to use over approximations. So here are the state of the art. You can try to over approximate the reachable sets. Okay. I'll show you sort of what it means in the next slide. But here are sort of really uh, what's out there that can uh, do this job, okay? And these are our papers this year. So that L really uh, proposes to use uh, piecewise linear polynomials to approximate the input-output mapping of the neural network and, and also give a um, error bound by solving a mixed integer linear program. Uh, very sick is an interesting approach where uh, instead of directly uh, approximating the input-output mapping, you actually uh, transform the neural network controllers into an equivalent hybrid automaton um, uh, for special classes of neural networks. And then you just throw the uh, uh, resulting combined hybrid automaton uh, into a reachability analysis too, okay, which I will again show you in the next slide. So, our work is you know, a bit later than these two, and we show that we are more advantageous in terms of the classes of neural networks that we handle, and also in terms of the tightness of the reachable set. Okay? And our approach is called ReachNN. Okay? So the common thing across all three approaches is that we uh, rely on what is called flow pipe constructions, and flow pipes are essentially over approximation of the reachable set. And in this particular case, we're looking at what are called Taylor model flow, uh, flow pipes. What that means is your reachable set is actually um, uh, uh, represented by a finite set of Taylor or uh, higher model, uh, higher order uh, Taylor models. Okay. So there are tools to do this. And what um, the diagram is trying to illustrate is you're trying to use these flow pipes to over approximate the trajectories that, um, uh, that uh, the system can actually generate. And then you want to check if this over approximation ever intersect with the avoid set. And at some uh, target time t, you want to check if the uh, reachable set is contained in the target set. 
Okay? If that's the case, then we have a positive answer uh, to the reachability problem. Okay? So naturally, um, um, you might sort of you know, already have an idea how to approach this problem. And you might want to essentially over approximate the states that you can reach at each delta um, time uh, t equals to k delta. And then you would feed this new, you would uh, treat this new reachable set as my, now, my new initial set, and then put it into this two called flow star for uh, con constructing the flow pipes. Okay? So we did a simple experiment on the very simple uh, physical plant uh, uh, given by those differential equations. And we also can just consider a simple neural network with two hidden layers, right, and the ReLU activation. Uh, actually, with two types of activation functions. So what happens here is that um, for the initial set uh, uh, given in the top right uh, box, the red lines represent actual trajectories if you were to uh, run the system from a single or a specific initial state. The, uh, the green boxes are uh, really uh, just pictorial representations of these flow pipes. Okay, so what this means is if you do um, this interval approximation, over approximation, um, the reachable set uh, explodes very quickly. And the reason uh, for that explosion is interval approximation uh, fails to capture the dependencies of state variables. So essentially, it does not directly over approximate the input output mapping of the neural network. It just tries to over approximate the set of reachable states at each time step. Okay. So our idea is to use uh, Bernstein polynomials to actually over approximate the neural network controllers. And uh, that's a specific, you know, that's how the Bernstein polynomial look like. Um, we don't need the details here, but the idea is that um, it's also uh, um, has nice properties for, uh, uh, for universal approximation. Um, and in fact, our approach can work with any Lipschitz continuous uh, neural network. And most neural networks are Lipschitz continuous. So this means that uh, it can be uh, applied to uh, neural ne networks with activation, ReLU activation functions, tangential activation functions, a combination of those activations, and so on. Okay. So if the, the black lines actual uh, neural network uh, input-output function, then you actually want to construct a Bernstein polynomial over, uh, approximation in the sense that um, it, um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can construct the error bounds on the over approximations. Okay, so fx is the neural network functions and BFDs uh, represents the Bernstein polynomial up to degree D for that, uh, for that F, okay? So, so the, the trick here is that we want to uh, keep epsilon small. So the over approximation is small, okay? So there's a known result uh, for any Lipschitz continuous function. And uh, in this case here, um, um, the error is given by this particular formula. Okay, um, but this simple Lipschitz constant base error is actually very pessimistic. Um, um, you notice that um, it's proportional to the Lipschitz constant, but there is this additional term here, right? D is actually the degree uh, of the Bernstein polynomial, and M is actually the dimension of the inputs. Okay. So what we did uh, is we actually use a sampling base approach. It's a very simple idea. And the key observation here is that the Bernstein polynomial approximation is also Lipschitz con continuous with the same Lipschitz constant L. So what that means is now if I partition my state space into some you know, k partitions, and then I can analyze the approximation errors uh, in each of these partitions uh, by con essentially look, doing a simple triangular uh, inequality, okay? And then ultimately, the actual over approximation error would be the max errors across all of these partitions. Okay? So the details, you can actually check out the paper if you're interested. But let me just quickly show you the comparisons with the interval over approximation that I showed you earlier. So the left is the same picture. 
And on the right is the same neural network control systems, but now um, you can see the green boxes, which are really representing these uh, flow pipes uh, or the reachable sets, are a lot tighter, right? And we can actually get a positive answer to the reachability questions that we set out to, to, uh, to investigate. Uh, because um, here there's no avoid set, but this uh, green box at this particular time instance are actually completely contained in the, in the blue box, which is my target set. Okay? So now we know for sure, or we have a proof, that this neural network uh, control system uh, will reach the target set. Okay. We also compare with uh, other state of the art. Uh, there are not that many uh, for neural network control systems. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, Verisic and Sherlock, which is the first uh, paper that I talked about. Um, so we look at different uh, uh, benchmarks, essentially different dynamical systems and different uh, neural networks with different activation functions. Um, across the board, you can see that uh, the green uh, pipes, which are really the flow pipes that uh, we, we get using rich and end, are a lot tighter than very sick, which is doing this equivalent hybrid automaton transformation. Um, and uh, we can also handle more varieties of neural networks. Um, so this Sherlock uh, um, uh, does a very good job in actually uh, bounding uh, the over approximations, but you can only handle ray loot uh, networks. Um, um, and it relies on solving a fairly expensive MILP to actually uh, 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 construct, uh, I mean, estimate that error bound. Okay. Okay. So after that, we make an interesting uh, uh, observation, uh, which is if we consider different neural networks for the same task, but with different Lipschitz constant, um, then uh, we get this behavior. So if we have a large, if the neural network have a large Lipschitz constant, then uh, we are not able to do this reachable set computation for, for a very long time uh, because of, uh, at some point it would explode, okay? And there's an intuitive reason for that because essentially Lipschitz constant tells you how quickly your, uh, your uh, controller uh, uh, output can change with respect to small, uh, um, changes in the input. Um, so this would explode. So if we are able to keep that Lipschitz constant small, um, then we are actually able to run uh, reachability analysis for a longer time period. And this is actually a consistent observation across uh, different tools, so not just for our two. So now the question becomes, um, can we somehow co-design the neural network controllers uh, for the purpose of doing uh, safety verification, right? So the, the idea that we had was to use knowledge distillation, right, to transfer the knowledge of a trained neural network controller uh, to an perhaps easier to verify neural network controller. Um, and in knowledge distillation, the model is just a simple teacher and student model, where the teacher is the trained neural network controller and the student is the controller that I'm trying to learn, which is hopefully easier to, to verify, okay? So the approach that we actually developed, uh, which appears later this year, um, is that we recognize we have two objectives here, right? If we are trying to retrain the neural network or trying to transfer the knowledge of one into another, we better keep the uh, regression error small, okay? <laughs> So the, we want the new network to have a similar performance as the originally trained network, which you might have trained using uh, you know, different or very complicated strategies. Um, and now we have an additional objective of keeping uh, the Lipschitz constant small. So you might have actually some target Lipschitz constant and you want to minimize the square loss of, of that. Um, uh, uh, of that, okay? So now you can actually end up with two gradients. One is with respect to the original loss function and the other is with respect to this new loss function, our lip, okay? And the way to do it is you can actually um, uh, try to uh, compute the angular bisector of these two gradients. And if, um, 
if you see that if you are going in the direction that would improve both, uh, both loss functions, then you just t simply take the uh, angular bisector, right, in the case where g loss dot g lib is actually greater than zero. Uh, but suppose if these two uh, gradients are telling you to go to uh, um, a space where in one you might reduce the loss, um, uh, regression uh, loss, but the other you might actually increase the Lipschitz constant, then you would actually first prioritize on performance, which is keeping the original loss function uh, small, which means that you would uh, uh, take this uh, gradient G final, which is a projection of G loss um, <coughs> on, on the <coughs> onto a hyperplane that is perpendicular to G lib. Okay? And if at some point your G loss is small enough, let's say small than some uh, epsilon that you, you design, then you can actually do some reprioritization, which means that now maybe you can uh, have an opportunity to further reduce uh, the Lipschitz constant, okay? So essentially you're just trying to do uh, 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 these two objective gradient descent to simultaneously, uh, hopefully, right, reduce J loss and J lib. So let me show you some uh, perhaps uh, visualization of what uh, for a case study that we did. So this is a, uh, a, a car uh, starting from a position in the top left. So ReLU tangents means that uh, this is a neural network uh, controller that has both ReLU activation functions and tangent uh, activation function. Um, in this case, here we know the dynamical model of the car. Um, and we train the neural network actually um, using a tool that computes the uh, uh, a robust optimal controller. Okay. And that's very computation expensive. So when you actually want to deploy it, uh, you might actually want to have a, um, a neural network controller. Okay. So, okay. so the, again, the red lines indicate trajectories of, these, uh, of the car. Um, and there's actually sets of trajectories. And we end up uh, with a uh, neural network with Lipschitz constant about 244 uh, for just this uh, simple loss function. Um, what ends up happening is the reachable set explodes uh, after maybe 20 steps. Um, if you set the target Lipschitz constant of the neural network to be 100, then um, um, you know, in simulation, we still can see that uh, the system achieved the task. It never uh, uh, collides with these, uh, um, the obstacle which is uh, described by this yellow box and also the small yellow box here. But if you do reachability analysis, um, then at some point, because of, again, the explosion of the reachable set um, or the very conservative over approximation of the reachable set, then it intersects with this obstacle. Right, so we don't know uh, whether uh, you can reach the target for sure. Um, and using our uh, essentially two gradient, uh, two objective uh, gradient descent, um, um, then we are able to uh, say for sure that for any uh, state that you start in the initial set, uh, the system will eventually reach the target set, which is this blue box, and also avoids the obstacles. Okay, so one thing that I want to note here is that these are essentially different neural network controllers. They are not the same controllers. In terms of a performance, you can see that the one with a smaller Lipschitz constant actually makes a slower turn, okay? But for the purpose of this control task, it doesn't matter, right? Because the goal is to reach the target and avoid the avoid set. So what are the open challenges? Um, there are actually quite a few. So all the state-of-the-art methods for verifying or answering uh, reachability of neural network controllers, they cannot scale to large number of inputs, which means that we cannot verify it, um, you know, end-to-end -end learning uh, or image input uh, for now. And um, the other problem is verification requires knowing the dynamical model. In practice, you might have a good idea of what that model is, uh, uh, or you might know some perturbation bounds on that model, but you need a model, right, um, uh, to, to answer these types of verification questions. 
But the caveat here is actually you, you, you may be able to improve safety, okay, without knowing the model, okay? We not, may not be able to prove reachability or safety, but we might still be able to improve it by quite a lot. And we studied this in the setting of model-free reinforcement learning, and in particular, we're interested in safe exploration, okay? So meaning that, uh, you know, you, you want, uh, you want the agent, when it's interacting with the real environment, uh, doesn't go into a lot of uh, safety hazards. Um, there are statistical ways uh, to guarantee safety um, in, even in the model-free setting. In particular, people have considered using Gaussian processes and so on, just to name uh, a few of these work. Um, the problem with Gaussian processes is, you know, you cannot address, uh, address high-dimensional uh, systems. Um, so what we did is instead of using GP to approximate the dynamics, we use GP to approximate a function that captures only the safety part of the systems, right? In particular, it captures the evolution of trajectory-based uh, safety. And we borrow ideas from control theory uh, using uh, control Lyapunov functions for asymptotic stability. So what that gives us is that you want some convergence to safe behaviors. So right, if you continue to train your system in the real environment, then ultimately you want this agent to be safe, which also means that the agent should be able to recover from unsafe behaviors. So I have about uh, four minutes left, so I won't uh, uh, bore you with all the details, but our setup is to uh, use Gaussian process, but do it in an online fashion. Um, and to steer the policies, uh, policy search um, in deep uh, reinforcement learning. So the difference is that you actually have two additional components uh, for safety estimations. One is this uh, G network, which is again a neural network. The other is this G pi, which is a Gaussian process model. So a key observation that we make is that this G, which is function approximator, uh, would be a candidate control Lyapunov function for the discrete control problem if it satisfies these uh, properties. And the small g pi is the Gaussian process uh, modeled for the safety evolution uh, for, a, uh, for, a, for the current policy pi. Okay. So in some sense, you actually uh, want to influence the policy search in a way that it satisfies uh, that inequality where g pi is greater than zero, okay? So, um, um, so basically, um, the outputs of this uh, function approximator g, we treat it as RIC observations of the GP model. Again, g pi does not model the, uh, the full dynamics of the system, but only models the evolutions uh, of safety, uh, uh, safety part. And ultimately, you want to solve a constraint optimization problem where L is actually the lower bound or the, uh, in the confidence interval when you are doing the GP estimate. Um, and one thing is that you cannot solve this uh, uh, constraint optimization problem directly uh, because you actually have to compute uh, L uh, based on your Gaussian process estimates. So what we did uh, eventually is we would um, uh, softly imposed uh, this constraint, okay? Um, so under some assumptions, which are the details in the papers, uh, you actually get statistical guarantees, okay? Um, so here's an experiment that we did on a relatively high dimensioned uh, system, which is a half cheetah uh, with unknown dynamics. Um, so the cheetah kind of looks like this, it's a half cheetah, so it only has two legs. Um, and we consider catastrophes or failures when the chila falls down and cannot actually recover, okay? So there are some interesting or uh, weird ways that, uh, you know, this system can fall. So we are um, comparing this to uh, the state-of-the-art uh, DDPG method uh, for uh, doing DRL. We also consider two different types of safety cost functions. So the design of the safety cost function is actually quite uh, tricky. 
Um, so what we did is we just used simple safety cause functions. So one is just related to the body rotation of the cheetah, the other is related to the height of the body. Okay, so these are proxies to whether the cheetah may fall or not. We don't know the exact thresholds for those safety cost functions. Um, so, um, so for the experiments, uh, so the, in terms of uh, performance, the red lines and the yellow lines are, are our methods for these two different safety cost functions with online GP estimation. Um, and one thing to notice is it can actually accelerate learning uh, because for this particular task, uh, not falling means your game, the cheetah can move. So, okay, th so there's a correlation between not failing and actually getting performance. Um, in terms of safety violation, um, so we are looking at, uh, you know, cumulative uh, catastrophes, um, then uh, both of our approach uh, would have a very small number of no failures, uh, no falls at all. Um, whereas for, um, uh, uh, for DDPG, uh, it takes a long time to train and also the, the agent uh, force a lot, okay? And we also compare with war time because we are doing this additional uh, procedure of doing uh, Gaussian process estimations. And even with that overhead taken into account, our method is able to learn much faster than DDPG. So the, the, the green line is the, what you get with DDPG, and these two lines are what we get with our methods. So um, just to show you quickly uh, how that uh, looks. Um, so in iteration one, so this is DDPG. Um, so it's deterministic deep policy to, uh, the gradient. And what we did is we are trying to use Gaussian process to estimate uh, the safety part of the system. Uh, and very quickly, we can achieve a high return, uh, whereas DDPG would still fluctuate, uh, you know, in terms of reward and also um, uh, you get into this uh, strange scenario where it's actually moving a little bit, uh, but uh, with the head of the cheetah, okay? Um, All right, so just to conclude, um, uh, we have an approach to answer the reachability question of neural network control systems, and the idea is to combine polynomial uh, or Bernstein polynomial regression with some sample-based analysis. And then additionally, we want to control the, the Lipschitz constant of the neural network. And I think that's an important uh, part uh, because verification typically is an afterthought, and you might be too late, uh, uh, you know, to get to that point uh, after all the training is done. And there's an interesting question to think about safety for model-free learning, because in this case here, you don't have the model, but your agent actually has to interact with a new uh, real environment. So think about the number of crashes that your car eventually learns to drive uh, in the real world. Um, and I want to live with this remark that there's a big gap between the scale of problems that verification can tackle and at least the scale of task that learning has demonstrated, okay, but not necessarily in deployment, okay, so, and hopefully we can close this gap, um, um, you know, in the short term. So thank you. This is the end of my talk. Um, So I can uh, talk about maybe the first part of your question first, which is AI square and so on. So they're actually looking at local robustness. So even though your input dimension might be, let's say, 100 by 100, they're actually looking at specific input, okay? Looking at specific input. And then you're looking, about, looking at the robustness of the adversarial robustness question. Um, so input dimension is kind of not an issue for them. Uh, you're, you know, they use abstract interpretation to essentially uh, over approximate the values, 
uh, across the neural network, but it's for a specific input, so it's not for sets of inputs. Uh, so that's why it might look like uh, you can handle high, high dimensional systems, but really it's for you know, individual inputs. So it's local robustness. Um, so for, uh, for these problems, um, um, all I can say at this point is I don't think any uh, soft polynomial uh, function approximation approach would work for high dimensional systems just because um, you know, the, the dimensionality issue doesn't go away. Um, um, so uh, there might be ways if you uh, would take the design part of the uh, design part into, uh, into the, the, the analysis and so you might be able to uh, actively reduce the dimensions when you design uh, the neural network. But for, in terms of verification, you know, uh, it's an inherent complexity. To, um, I don't think it will go away. Yeah, it's also why this problem is really hard. And that's why it's, uh, I guess we shouldn't trust end-to-end -end learning, at least at this point. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so I'm happy to take questions offline. I'll be around. Oh, but maybe there's one more. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, this is relatively high dimension from the dynamical systems point of view. So it's 17 dimension. I wouldn't call it like really high dimension as in an image. Um, um, so, uh, so there's a lot of, I think, uh, details in how to make this tractable uh, in the sense that uh, we had to limit uh, the, the size of uh, so data. So here, uh, you know, as you get more data points, right, your estimate becomes better. Uh, but because of the computational complexity, right, this uh, is a cubic complexity for doing the GP estimate, we have to keep that uh, 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 data uh, set to about 5,000. So which means that we have to find a way to kick out a data point and take the new data point. Um, so we have details in the, in the paper as well. Um, so, um, um, so, so even for, I think the, the takeaway message for this problem is that we sh for model free learning, we shouldn't attempt to uh, model the entire system, but we should only uh, model the specification relevant parts of the model. In this case, would be uh, safety or asymptotic recovery from unsafe states. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'll be around. <laughs>